And now we will ask our lovely Karin to come up and give us the message on Amos. Thank you, Marcella, and good morning, Pine Grove. I know this has been said from the front a number of times in this series, but I am genuinely really excited that we're going through the Minor Prophets um, in this series. And it's a series of books, and as Les mentioned, minor in length and not in message. So they're the shorter of the prophet books, of which there are 12. But they pack quite a punch, and one of the reasons I like them so much is that they're almost like a glue, for me anyway. I find that they're almost like a glue between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, and of course, Jesus is that ultimate glue in the story. But they allow us to look into or to start looking into the New Testament from an Old Testament perspective. And it's this interesting lens, or as I like to think about it, like a shining of a light from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So this morning we'll be looking at the book of Amos. And for those who did your homework and read the book of Amos, great. For those of you who are like, oh man, I had to read the book of Amos. Or those of you who are like, I had to read the book of Amos? This summary will be for you. So in all seriousness, Amos is one of those books where the message doesn't necessarily come to the surface for everyone immediately. And I know some of you probably got about three chapters in to Amos and thought you had read judgment, wrath, and sin so many times that you probably thought like, oh, I got it. This is a book about judgment. But that's only the surface, and there's so much richness in the book of Amos. And I was, we were discussing with Carl this morning. Sorry to put you on the spot there, Carl. But there's a lot of insight in this book that ties into our current society, the world we live in today. And it's quite remarkable. And I think, as Carl said, something along the lines of, like, well, I think we've kind of always been like that. <laughs> and therefore, we see this continuation of sin and how we live our lives and how we oppress people, whether on purpose or inadvertently. But Amos is one of those books where I find that the historical and cultural context play a critical role in understanding what the book says. And I'm always a fan of historical critical interpretation, amongst other styles of interpretation when reading scripture. But I find that in this book, it's particularly important to understand the place and time of the events, who is involved, what were some of the religious and social customs of the time. And through those, the book comes alive, and we are able to tie the truth that we read in Amos to our lives today. But remember, this is only an overview of the book. We could probably have a 10 sermon series on Amos. Um, so I'd encourage you to, to read it or to read it again um, and to break it down a little bit, maybe according to um, some of the breakdown that you'll, you'll see in the sermon today. So who was this prophet Amos? The root of the name Amos comes from um, the phrase to carry. And some of the longer names or longer forms of the name in Hebrew, um, Ammonite, Phoenician, um, actually have a longer meaning of like God has carried or an infant has been carried by God. Amos was a man whose life and lifestyle were devoted to serving the Lord. But rather interestingly, he was a layperson. He wasn't a son of a prophet. He wasn't the son of a priest. He was just a regular guy who was a shepherd. And we read a grower of sycamore figs in Tekoa, which is a small Judean town, approximately 20 kilometers from the border at that time between Judah and Israel. <coughs> 
And as explained by Chuck Swindle, I really liked this quote of his, where he says, Amos's connection to the simple life of the people made its way into the center of his prophecies as he showed a heart for the oppressed and the voiceless in the world. So when approximately and where did Amos prophesy? Amos's ministry was during the reigns of King Uzziah of Judah and King Jeroboam II of Israel. We know that the king's reigns overlapped by about 15 years, from 767 to 753 BC, which gives us one means of identifying approximately when the writings uh, came about for the book of Amos. And we also know from the text in Amos that he prophesied two years before the earthquake, which is recorded in Amos 1.1 and Zechariah 14.5. And an earthquake is recorded in some of the historical records from that period. So we know that we're about a halfway point, the halfway point in the 8th century BC. So in terms of looking at the text and going into the text, it's helpful to look at what was going on in 8th century, or the middle of the 8th century BC in Israel. From a social and economic context, we read that the reigns of Uzziah of Judah and Jeroboam II in Israel have been described as the Victorian age of the Hebrew kingdom. It was a time of peace for Israel and its neighbors, it was a time of prosperity. It was a time of national confidence. There was military security. People felt pretty good about life. They were living, as we'll see, a more maybe luxurious life. They were resting. They were relaxing. They were enjoying the fruits of their labor. We were in a time of commercial activity, a type of economic boom. I heard one pastor describe it as an olive oil boom. At the time, people were doing well economically, or at least part of society was. And what we would consider as the upper middle class of society were doing well. They were probably going on vacation. The state was becoming more prominent in setting obligations for society. And at this point, we see a bit more the commercialism, almost like capitalist marketplace, where we're also seeing in the 8th century BC separation or that more pronounced separation between the rich and the poor, between the privileged and the less privileged. We see a decoupling of those tribal ties people would have had and more attention and power being given and centralized towards the kingdom and society's uh, responsibilities. Interestingly, archaeology has uh, uncovered what appears to be large private homes. We read about this in Amos 5.11. Mass production of pottery bowls and jars with apparent trademarks at the time. Furniture that was inlaid with ivory. Large cellars and cups that tend to indicate that the wine that was being consumed was being uh, imported. Amos tells us that the people ate lamb and veal. They drank wine by the bowl full and anointed themselves with the finest oils. So we get the point. This is a society where people are living well. They're living pretty large. They're at peace. And they're enjoying themselves. From a religious context, also ties back to our society, how we live, how we understand our interactions amongst ourselves and with God. Many Israelites were outwardly religious, but not inwardly connected to God. There were pagan idols and shrines. Some Israelites still worshipped the Canaanite god Baal, as well as other gods. Historical sources would tend to indicate that even some of the priests at the time were pagan. A general assessment could be that the Israelites remembered that they were favored by God. They had a special status before God, but they had forgotten the responsibility that went with having this special covenant with God, this special status amongst people. 
So here's where we find ourselves in the 8th century where people are living large, not too concerned with what God has to say. And at this time, God calls Amos, a lay person, shepherd, and farmer from Judah to leave his home in the south and go prophesy to his neighbors in the north. So we'll quickly look at how the book of Amos is organized, and I will tell you, I really like the summary that was done by the Bible Project on this. They divided it this way, so did my NIV um, study Bible. I'd encourage you, if you're looking for a summary of what was taught this morning, I think it's seven or eight minutes long, and it's really, really well done. So in chapters one to two, the message to Israel's neighbors and Israel. Chapter 1 opens with quite a clear statement. We read, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. I can tell you that when I read that, I knew this was going to be a serious matter. This is the opening. This is the opening line. But before we read anything concerning Israel, following the introduction, we read a series of poems by Amos that accuse seven of Israel's neighbors of all sorts of wrongdoings and injustice. And some would suggest that Amon was quite an able communicator, as he didn't go right to the fire and brimstone prophecy for Israel. But he started out by softening Israel a little bit, and talking a little bit of trash about their neighbors. And they probably felt pretty good about themselves. Like, yes! So Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab, Judah, they all have in this first, in these first two chapters, their own prophecy and judgment coming to them for their bad actions. But then comes the prophecy regarding Israel, which I'll point out is three times longer than any of the poems regarding Israel's neighbors. And we read in chapter 7, verse 8, like what is the purpose of this and what did God say was his purpose? He was setting what we read is a plumb line. If you know what a plumb line is, it's like a string with a weight at the bottom of it. It's to see whether walls may be vertical, um, but also to test the depth of certain things. And God was testing whether Israel or how straight Israel may have been and its depth with this plumb line. But we read this towards the end of the book. So let's read a bit of what God has to say through Amos. Beginning in chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God, they drink wine taken as fines. I destroyed the Amorite before them, though he was tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. I destroyed his fruit above and his roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt, and I led you 40 years in the desert. I also raised up prophets from among your sons and Nazarites from among your young men. Is this not true, people of Israel? That you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Now then, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. The swift will not escape, the strong will not muster their strength, and the warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground, the the flat-footed soldier will not get away, and the horseman will not save his life. 
Even the bravest warrior will flee naked on that day. Well then. <laughs> Amos accuses the wealthy in Israel of trampling on the heads of the poor in verse 7 and creating an environment where the poor become victims of grave injustice. They sell the needy for a pair of sandals. Specifically, Amos refers to the injustice of allowing the poor to be sold into slavery and denying the slaves justice. We read that this injustice was being particularly, or it was particularly egregious for God as the Hebrews themselves had been saved by God from slavery, and still they were imposing a similar oppression or allowing that type of oppression to take place in their land. They were the perpetrators. And we read this as God is asking them, I brought you up out of Egypt and I led you 40 years in the desert. When I read this passage, I felt it was almost like a how dare you passage. You have been given so much, and from you much was expected. But they've let God down. The second section of the book of Amos in chapters 3 to 6 are poems that express a message to Israel and its leaders specifically on two, on two different themes. The first one, religious hypocrisy, and the second one, idolatry. People are attending the temple at this time, going through the rituals, but they're completely ignoring the poor, allowing injustice and oppression to take place, perpetuating injustice and oppression. And the Israelites worship as we read in Amos, was completely disconnected from their actions. Amos states that God despises their worship and will not accept their offerings. God says, you only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all of your sins. And this ties back in the commentaries to what I explained where God is saying, I have chosen you as a special people so that the whole world would see who I am through you. But that came with a great deal of expectation and responsibility. And the people of Israel had not taken that on or respected the covenant they had with God. We read in Amos 4, 4 to 5, go to Bethel, and Bethel is this, sanctuary and place of worship of many gods. Go to Bethel and sin. Go to Gilgal and sin yet more. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three years. Burn leavened bread as a thank offering and brag about your free will offerings. Boast about them, you Israelites, for this is what you love to do. Wow. In Amos 5, 21 to 23, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Regarding idolatry in Amos 5, 25 to 27. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. 
God, through Amos, reminds Israel that in days past they had turned to worshiping stars and planets, preferring nature over nature's God in 2 Kings 23. Pagan religions allowed them to indulge in sexual immorality and to become wealthy through any means possible, including oppression. Because they would refuse to worship the one true God, they would bring about their own destruction. But in the midst of this prophecy of judgment regarding the idolatry and this untrue worship and sinful heart, we find God's desire for his people. In verse 24, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness, righteousness like a never-ending stream. And I don't know if this rings any bells for anyone, if you've ever heard this cited somewhere, history buffs. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-ending stream. We are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. From Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, I Have a Dream. So when we're talking about the poor, and I'll get into that in a little bit, we're talking about the financially, economically poor, but it is much broader as well, um, as we see from our heroes in the social justice realms and where others are oppressed in other ways that may not only be economic. But what do these words mean? These are very important words in the book of Amos. Righteousness, sedaka, which actually should be with a Z, and justice, mispa. For righteousness, the Hebrew word really means right and equitable relationships between people regardless of their social differences. And when we read mispa, justice, we're talking about the actions, concrete actions taken to correct the injustice and to bring about righteousness. So the bringing back of relationships and making those relationships whole, regardless of people's standing in society, and as justice, those actions that will allow those relationships to be made whole again and to correct the injustice of society. So when we read that verse in Amos 5.24, it means so much more when we take that into account. But let justice and those actions roll on like a river and righteousness, the right and equitable relationships, be like a never-ending stream. Chapters 7 to 9 of the book, this third section, are really about Amos' visions and about what is to come. We read about a vision of Israel being decimated by locusts. Amos prays, and that does not come to fruition. Israel uh, being decimated by fire. We hear the prayer, that not coming to fruition. Israel being eaten like overripe fruit. And... God striking the temple in Israel on the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. And at this point, God says, I can't let this continue and I can't let this pass, so this, this will happen. But there is hope in this third part towards the very, very end of the ninth chapter, in the ninth chapter, We read, in, the da- in that day I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. 
The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people Israel. They will rebuild their ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them. So the book presents what I would consider a juxtaposition between God's desire and the requirement for justice and also his plan to reconcile the world to himself. And there are many different commentaries on what these verses mean um, at the end of, of chapter 9. But what we do see is that there will be restoration through David's line, and things will be made whole again, which will include people from all nations and not only Israel. So what are the main takeaways from the book of Amos? I've done a little summary of these three parts and the key verse at 524. But the main takeaways for the book, I would say, are that everyone will ultimately answer to God, whether we reject God now, later, do evil that seems to go unpunished, do bad behavior and sin, knowing full well God's righteousness, his expectation. Justice is the Lord's, and nothing will go unseen. We're all answerable to God. The second point is really that this, this superficial and ritualistic religion is offensive to God. going through the motions, not investing heart, not seeking and genuinely seeking to come into relationship with God and to do his will is offensive to God. A third one which hits harder almost, I think, in our society is complacency being dangerous. We tend in our society often to let kind of other people do the work. We're very comfortable in the spaces we live within. And when we're aware of and see certain types of oppression, they can be easy to ignore or not to fully address and not to fully invest in addressing. And the fourth point is that oppressing the poor is wholly unacceptable to God. To ignore the needs of the poor is to ignore God. God created everyone equal and has given us responsibility to stop injustice and to care and genuinely care for those in need. And although most of us probably don't set out to act like the Israelites did in the book of Amos. Some of it sounds a little bit extreme to us, I'm sure. That could probably be a whole other sermon. <laughs> but how about some of the clothing or food items we consume that are produced in less than ethical ways? Let's say chocolate. How often do we think about the child labor involved in the chocolate trade, in coffee plantations, in some of the fruit we consume, and how those are produced and prepared for our consumption. And I will tell you that if we spend a little bit of time looking into practices of various companies, multinational companies around the world, their labor force, their expectations for workers, the ages at which their workers become involved in labor for various companies, we would be shocked 
but we rarely do that work to truly look into the practices of the companies that produce all of the things we consume in our society, which very much resembles the Israelites Amos was speaking to. How about the vacations we take at various resorts that deprive locals of accessible and clean water? How about the life choices we make that harm the environment, cause hardships, increase global warming, make disease more transmittable in some countries? There are all sorts of choices that we make that have a risk of impacting on the economic and social well-being of others and that have a real risk of oppressing the poor. And the poverty referred to in the book of Amos, I think is first and foremost when we're talking about classes and slavery and people being sold for various items, we're probably talking more about economic poverty. But for those who've participated in the poverty boot camp that was put on by Food for the Hungry a few years ago at the church, have likely encountered a definition of poverty that goes far beyond what we would first think of an economic poverty. And there is a theologian I'm very fond of who's done a lot of work in this area. He's a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary. He's a Christian relief and development advocate, and he's written a lot about relationally based poverty. This book, Walking with the Poor, presents a number of different definitions of, of what is poverty and how we encounter poverty in our society and solutions and how the church should act, how Christians should act vis-a-vis -vis these different types of poverty. And I'll just go over the four main categories um, that were also referred to, and this was probably the source, um, at Food for the Hungry. But essentially, how we get to understanding poverty caused by sin and what that may look like in society. So the four areas of poverty or causes of poverty that Bryant Myers describes in the last uh, portion of his book is really poverty based on broken relationships with God, having other gods having domesticated gods. The second is broken relationships with self, marred identity, diminished vocation, poverty of, be of being, lacking acceptance, addiction in all of its many forms, mental health issues, many of which can come back to a broken relationship with, with ourselves how we understand ourselves vis-a-vis -vis God and how the world has let sin creep into those areas. The third category is broken relationships with the environment. Overused land, poor land, no land, pollution, global warming, lack of access to water, lack of access to food. Broken relationships with others is the last category. And here just examples, but violence and racism, God complexes, domination between families or within families, between people, classes of people, broken political, social, economic, educational, religious <laughs> systems, economic poverty, and lack of opportunities. And I think the way we look at poverty as relational poverty and in terms of our relationship with God, with ourselves, with the environment, with others, can really open us up to understanding more about oppression and more about how people of privilege like ourselves, whether we wish to admit it or not, have an impact on the world around us.
as the church moves into a season of evaluating its values, its mission, its vision, I know Danny made an announcement last week about these exercises that are coming up in June. I would really encourage you prior to participating in the interviews and in the workshops to consider what poverty God is putting on your heart for you as an individual and for this church to work to address. It's pretty clear to me in reading Amos that we individually and as a church are called to let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. But that means putting effort into concrete actions. It means putting together a plan it means aligning the giftedness of this church with the ministries that we want to be involved in to have a tangible impact in our communities. But I would encourage you to start thinking about that, to start praying about it and letting God, letting the Spirit lay on your heart. What are those values that you hold dear within the church? What is that work that you feel called to? So that when we sit together and discuss those, we're able to bring those pieces together and really come up with the beautiful picture of, of what Pine Grove is as a church, what our priorities are, and how we express love to our community. So with that, I will just pray and ask the Lord to lay these things on our heart to convict us where there is sin, where we contribute to oppression, to show us how we can do better and where we turn from our wicked ways to a place where we are enabling those streams of living water, where our faith turns into action, where we rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, in a tangible way and towards bringing about that social justice in the community of Beacon Hill and more broadly. Lord, we come to you this morning with heavy hearts, with broken hearts, with expectant hearts. Lord, we've read in Amos about the sin, about the hypocrisy, about the idolatry. And Lord, we pray that if we're dabbling in those things, in our faith walk with you, that you would reveal those and bring them to the surface. And that you would call us and bring us to a place of repentance, and to a place of renewing our walk with you and renewing our faith in you and of joining our story with yours, Lord, for the building of your kingdom. And Lord, as we approach these exercises at church on values and mission and vision, we pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to the world around us to our community, allowing us to see, Lord, the poverty that sits within and convicting us in our hearts of the gifts we have that we can mobilize to help address that poverty. Lord, inspire us by your spirit. Show us your way. Show us your vision for Pine Grove. Show us our individual missions, Lord, as we step out, into this ch out of this church and into the world around us, where we can help make the world whole again in view of your promises, of your mercy, and of your unending love. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name.